No, you can leave it there. Yeah, 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 I need this space. <coughs> Praise the Lord. Happy Praise Sabbath. Lord. Happy Sabbath. You sounded so beautiful this morning. Uh, Everyone enjoying worshiping the Lord today. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Well, it's good to be here, and it's an honor to be before you to share with you what uh, I have from the Word of God for us today. Um, I do have an interesting type, topic, uh, title, I should say, The Diabolical Duo. Um, so we're going to be looking at a diabolical duo today. We'll look at a couple of them, actually. There are a couple that are outlined in the Bible. Um, when you think of the word diabolical, what do you think of? Evil. 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 Or, or of the devil, or, or something that's very menacing, right? And, and that's what we're going to see about this diabolical duo. Um, and the picture that you see there, who can tell me what that's a picture of? So it's, um, the, I forget her name, but that's not her. Salome. Yes. Salome. Uh-huh, Salome. Her daughter, Okay, yes, yeah, so... So, so what we have there is we have King Herod, and we have his wife, illegitimate wife, Herodias, and Salome, the daughter. And so this is our first diabolical duel that we will look at. But before we get into the message, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come with thankful hearts today. We are grateful for being here, and we're uh, excited about the word that you have for us today. I pray that you would uh, touch each heart to be open to receive the message. Lord, today we will touch on topics that may be new to some, and some may not have heard these things before. And some of these things are of very serious nature. So I pray that you would help all of us to realize that these messages come not from me, not from the church, but from Jesus himself and from his word. And may your Holy Spirit go before the words, and bless the hearers. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. So we have a duo, diabolical duo. If you turn to Mark chapter 6, Mark chapter 6, you will start at verse 17. Matthew, Mark excuse me, Mark, chapter 6, and we want verse 17 is where we will begin. And say amen when you have it. We're going to make this, we're going to make this picture make sense. Okay? It says, For Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John. Now, who's John? Okay. That, that's one of his, one of Jesus' what? And what else? One of his disciples? Right, one of his disciples, right? And so we already see where the king has one of God's disciples and bound him where? In prison. In prison for who? Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. For John, verse 18, had said unto Herod, it is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Therefore Herodias had what? A quarrel, a quarrel against him and would have him what? Killed. Killed. But she could not. So we have a situation. And what we want to build on with this diabolical duo is we're seeing where a mother and a daughter team are going to unite to persecute the people of God, or to persecute the prophets of God, okay? So now, if we continue on in verse 20, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was what? A just man, and a holy, and observed him, and when he heard him, he did many things, and heard him gladly. And when a convenient day was come that Herod on his birthday made a supper to his lords, high captains, and chief estates of Galilee, and when the daughter of the said Herodias came in and danced 
and pleased Herod and them that sat with him, the king said unto the damsel, what? Ask of me whatsoever thou wilt, and what? I will give it thee. So we see here he threw a party for his birthday, got intoxicated, right? We're going to see also that there's intoxication involved in the other diabolical duo that we will look at later. And something about that wine, right? About drinking that wine, throwing those parties. And then she comes out and she dances, obviously, seductively for him. So there's seducing going on. As we will see in the other diabolical duo that we have, there will be some, uh, some uh, seducing of the people going on. And now we see where she asks what? Let's find out what she asks. It says, verse 23, And he swear unto her, Whatsoever thou shalt ask of me, I will give it thee unto the half of my kingdom. And she went forth and said to who? Her mother. Her mother. So here we have the mother and the daughter in cahoots joining together. What shall I ask? And she said, what? The head, the head of John the Baptist. So now the persecution comes in. And she came in straightway with haste unto the king and asked, saying, I will that thou give me by and by in a charger the head of John the Baptist. And the king was what? Exceeding sorry. sorry. He realized he had been what? Tricked. He had been duped. Right? Yet for his oath, because you know in those days, kings, when they said something or let something come out of their mouth, they couldn't retract it. They couldn't take it back. Once it was said, it had to be done. And that's why he was sorry also, because he knew that there was nothing he could do. Yet for the oath's sake and for their sakes, which sat with him, he would not reject her. And immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought. And he went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head in a charger and gave it to the damsel, and the damsel gave it to her mother. All right, so now this wasn't the only mother-daughter team. We see that also there was another mother-daughter team that persecuted God's people in the Old Testament. Look at 1 Kings 18.13, and can I have a reader for 1 Kings 18.13? First Kings eighteen thirteen. And when you get it and you're the reader, just go ahead and and read for us. Chapter eighteen of First Kings, verse thirteen. Who's my reader? Okay, thank you, brother. First King eighteen thirteen. Was it not told my Lord what I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord? How I hid a hundred men of the the Lord's prophets by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water? That's right. Yes, that's it. All right. Amen. And so he's saying here that Jezebel, what did she do? She slew the prophets of the Lord. So Jezebel, who was her husband? King Ahab, right? So again, we see a woman that was in power that was slaying the prophets of God. Now, can someone else read 2 Kings 11.1? 1? Because we said what? There's a dynamic duo, and the duo was what? A mother and daughter. a daughter. Yes. Who's speaking in this verse? In this verse, this is Elijah. Elijah the prophet. Or no, 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 wait. Hold on. Hold on. Uh, let me see. Yes, yes. And he, Obadiah, was in the way we heard Elijah. It was Obadiah. Go to verse 7. Verse 7. Good question. And as Obadiah was in the way, behold, Elijah met him and he knew him and fell on his face and said, Art thou that my Lord Elijah? 
So Obadiah, and if you read earlier, you see that Obadiah was sent on a, on a mission. And uh, he, was going, he was sent to go get Elijah. Okay, good question. 2 Kings 11.1, 1, who's my reader? Go ahead. And when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the seed royal. Okay, so now the mother destroyed a prophet, or at least attempted to kill the prophet, and then you had Athaliah, her daughter, who slew all the firstborn of the royal seed. Again, a mother and a daughter team teaming up to do what? To persecute God's people. Keep that in mind. That's our theme today. We have a mother and a daughter team joining together to persecute God's people. Now, there's another piece to this, too. Uh, um, what's her name? Um, Jezebel and Athaliah, another thing they were well known for doing was also forcing pagan worship onto God's people as well. And so keep that in mind as we study today. Okay. Question number two, what is the second angel's message in Revelation 14, 8? Let's turn to Revelation 14. And we're going to start at verse 6, actually. Revelation 14. And we're going to look at verses 6 through 8. And say amen when you have it. Amen. If you don't have it, say wait. All right, no waits. Revelation 14, 6 through 8, we will read. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. In our key verse, verse 8, and there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city, because she made all nations do what? Drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So now again, like we saw in the story with uh, John the Baptist, there was wine involved along with the situation. We see also in this second combination we're going to look at, there is wine involved as well. But it's not going to be the wine of the alcoholic persuasion. Uh, we're going to see that it is of a different nature as we study. So the second angel's message is that what? Babylon has, is, is fallen. Babylon is fallen. That great city, and because it made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of its fornication. Now, uh, eight testimonies, page 94. She made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. How is this done? By forcing men to accept what? A spurious Sabbath, a false Sabbath. So we're going to see that part of this wine is going to be teaching or doctrine is what is the wine in this new duo of mother and daughter team, okay? So keep that in mind. These little things you want to make note of, we're going to build as we go, and it'll make more and more sense as we go. Now, not yet, however, can it be said that she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. She has not yet made all nations do this. So the point that we're making is Babylon is fallen, but the fall is not complete as of yet. Okay, not until this condition shall be reached and the union of church and the world shall be fully accomplished throughout Christendom will the fall of Babylon be complete. Okay, so that's important to understand that, that right now, point? Yeah, oh yeah, what I think. I skipped that and put fall. <laughs> um, so the change is a progress. One Excuse me, the change is a progress, progressive one. We didn't type that right, did we? Okay, progressive one, 
And the perfect fulfillment of Revelation 14.8 is yet future. And that's from Great Controversy 389. We were working on this and some of the typos are there. So if you see one, let me know. I, we needed to proofread a little better, okay? But, but the key point is it's progressive, okay? So keep that in mind as well, that this is something that, um, I'll give you an example, I'm kind of jumping ahead, but, but it's just like what we see right now today, right? With all the mandates and, and, and the masks and different things of that. Have you not seen how it's been progressive? It's, it's, it's gone on in little stages and each time it gets ramped up, then it gets where it gets more and more, uh, uh, I would say, give me a word, it becomes more intensified. intensified. Thank you, that's the word I was looking for. It becomes more intensified, yes. She didn't want to go into the chambers to, to argue. She didn't even show up. Right. Because she was afraid that she's going to get the um, virus. And it's just showing us that this thing is building. Yes, yeah. things, things are building. Yeah. And, and again, getting a little ahead of myself, but I will tell you that, you know, like I, I share with people and I talk with them because, you know, the way they have things set up right now, it was kind of just a test to see, okay, how do we get people in compliance? Mm -hmm. How do we get people to comfortably agree with what they don't agree with mm -hmm. and get them to be comfortable doing so? Mm -hmm. And they've been very successful. Mm -hmm. And what you can see is this, as this is what I share with people. Once you have that outline or that format, now it just becomes plug and play. Mm -hmm. Now whatever you wanna take out and put in fits in that same structure. Mm -hmm. And we know that spurious Sabbath is going to be one of the next things that they're going to want to plug and play and put in there and have us to follow and to be in compliance with, okay? But we'll get into that a little bit more. But I just wanted to kind of put that seed out there that we can see. So question three, how does God symbolize Babylon in Revelation? Let's turn to 1718 of Revelation. Say amen when you have it. Amen. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. So Babylon is symbolized in Revelation as what? A woman, right? So your answer for that is a woman. In Bible prophecy, a woman often symbolizes a church, right? Uh, a pure woman represents God's true church as described in Revelation 12. An unfaithful woman represents a church that has departed from the scriptures. So we can be certain that the fallen woman, who she is, because she was ruling when uh, John wrote the book of Revelation. What world power was ruling during the time that John wrote Revelation? Rome, okay, exactly, Rome. All right, so question four, what other evidence from Revelation 17 proves that Babylon refers to Papal Rome? We have some bullet points, and I should have made these larger. I'll make sure that you can, I'll read them for you. Uh, point A, <laughs> she is guilty of blasphemy. Okay, that's found in Revelation 17, verse three. It says, so he carried me away in the spirit and in the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So the first point that we can know that this power is Rome is because she's guilty of blasphemy. Who can give me one example of, of the blasphemy that uh, Rome is guilty of? There, let's do the mic. Go ahead. You have one? Uh, vicar of uh, Jesus Christ in place of Jesus Christ or Christ representative mm -hmm. on, uh, on earth. Okay, so to clarify and to make sure that we understand what his point is, blasphemy would obviously fall under a couple of categories. One, either claiming to be God or B, 
claiming the characteristics or attributes that only belong to God, right? So his point was that they claim that the Pope is God on earth and that he is God. And so that is blasphemy. Go ahead. One, and the one other definition of, the, of blasphemy is the power to, for, to uh, the claim of the power to forgive sins. Exactly. And that was the second part. When I said an attribute or characteristic that belongs only to God, the other one that they use is that they say that they can forgive sins. And so that's where they're guilty of blasphemy. Now, B, she dresses in purple and scarlet. Now, that's very clear. If you've ever watched a uh, ceremony uh, of the Catholic Church, you'll notice that at very high sessions or gatherings, your cardinals are always wearing red and your bishops are always wearing purple. And so, therefore, the Bible is describing the red and the purple as dressed. C, she is called the mother. Yes. Yes. Okay, you talk about the colors. Uh -huh. um, Point B. It says scarlet and purple. Mm -hmm. Is it true that the color is missing? That's why the color blue is supposed to be, because it's red, purple, and blue for a reason, but I'm, I'm not sure. I think you it, might be discussing something else. Oh. I, I think I know your point, but I don't, it, it's not on this, on this matter here. This okay. matter, we're just simply trying to huh. identify um, the power, and when we're looking to identify them, this is one of the characteristics that stands out, is, is, the, is the red and the purple, okay? Um, verse 5, who will read verse 5 of Revelation 17? Give me a reader. And upon her forehead was a name written, <coughs> Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and abominations of the earth. Okay, so there we find that she's called a mother. How many are familiar with the fact that the Roman Catholic Church considers itself the mother church of all the churches of the earth? Yes, she's called the mother church. And matter of fact, if you think about it, in America where we have our Protestant churches, how did those churches come about? They left what? The Catholic Church through the reformers, Martin Luther, Wycliffe, Calvin, all those guys, right? Because what? They had a protest or they had a problem with some of the teachings of the church, right? Yep. And remember Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses on the door of the church, right? Now, to be a mother and then to have the daughter, you know, uh, union, you have to have daughters, right? So these Protestant churches are what would be considered the daughters of the Catholic Church. Does that make sense? Because they broke away or spawned off, or you could even say like when your kids grew up at 18 and left the house, right? They, they left the house, so to speak, right? And even today, a lot of the more modern popes have been asking uh, for the churches to come back, to come under the uh, umbrella of the Catholic Church to reunite and to come back and stop being wayward children, so to speak, right? But now here's an interesting point. Although they came out of the church and broke away because of discrepancies <laughs> with teachings and doctrines, they did, however, do what? They still kept many of the traditions and teachings because just like a mother or a daughter are similar and look alike, right? they still had characteristics where they looked just like the mother. So what would be some of those ideas that you might think that, that, that she kept? Sunday is a sacred day, yes, in the back. Life after death. Life after death. Baptism. Yep, sprinkling. sprinkling of baptisms. And, we, and we, we, let's get one more from Aaron. Let, let's get Aaron's. Found out that they still do indulgences. So mm -hmm. you go to the confessional and tell them, tell the priest what you've done, and they say, okay, just pray three Hail Marys and mm -hmm. then pay this, and you'll be all right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Okay. And so, so that we can build on this thing, so you can see that. So the mother would be 
the Roman Church, the Catholic Church, and the daughters that are going to unite are the Protestant churches of America. Okay, so that we can remember we talked about a mother-daughter union. And I told you there would be another one that we'll look at, and this is the one that we'll look at. Now, D, she has harlot daughters who are also fallen. We kind of covered that right there with that discussion we just had. And how they're fallen is because they still retained some of the teachings and doctrines that are not biblical. Okay. Now, before we continue on, as I meant to give this disclaimer at the front, the, the stuff we're going to cover today, it's going to be real heavy on the Roman Catholic Church of Protestant America. It's not on the people who are members of these churches, right. who, who are true believers in the Lord Jesus and worship the Lord. God says what? I have many sheep that are not of this fold, but I will what? Bring them to. So don't hear me wrong. This is not in any way an attack. On, on individual believers uh, in these denominations and faiths uh, because there are many sincere believers who are probably better Christians than I am, okay, to be honest with you. I'm still a work in progress, okay? But, but we're, we're talking about the system of worship and about the practices that are unbiblical and that um, we need to correct. If, if, if we don't know any better, we need to, to correct. Does that make sense? Okay. Sure. That question was how, uh, what other evidences from Revelation 17 proves that Babylon refers to papal Rome? So it was this question. Okay. So these are little kind of proof texts that we can find. Okay. And then the next one, it says she persecuted and martyred the saints. In verse 6. I don't think we have to spend a lot of time on that. Anyone that knows history knows that the Roman Catholic Church did a lot of killing in the name of the church, right? From the Spanish Inquisitions to uh, many other uh, things um, that we can name. So, yes, during the Dark Ages. So she persecuted and martyred the saints. And F, she sits upon seven mountains. That's in verse 9. If you ever Google the seven mountains, Rome will come up. It's known as the city that sits on seven hills or seven mountains. Okay. And lastly, she ruled over the kings of the earth. Now, I, I learned something interesting watching a, a presentation this morning before I came in that I didn't know or maybe I knew and forgot. But in the Middle Ages, in the Dark Ages that she was talking about, you know how many people play chess? or know of the game chess. Okay, with the pieces and the way you set up the board, you have the king and the queen, and who's on either side of the king or the queen? A bishop, a bishop. And the reason why is because in those days, the kings didn't make many moves or do much of anything unless they clarified it with the bishop and got approval of the bishop first. And there was one story I heard of, and I can't recall the king's name, but he had fallen in such bad graces with the bishop that he had to like stand outside and pray for forgiveness for three years or something three days, three days. <laughs> yeah that's uh, king henry yes king henry uh he had to go or to actually actually uh walk across the alps uh, to reach the winter residence of uh, Pope Leo, I believe. Okay. Don't don't quote me on that one. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had to be there in the in the snow, bare barefoot, and uh, just uh, just one uh, one very thin cloth, just because he dared to say that. Uh, in my country, I am the one that makes decisions. Yes, yes. So, so the Pope and the Papacy had to correct him on that and let him realize that, that yes, that uh, they actually uh, ruled over the kings of the earth. And even now today, how many times in the United States, in our political meetings and buildings, do you see the Pope and the Papacy there? Yeah. Do you see it? Yes, in the back. <laughs> Um, even in England, they have a royal family, and the royal family can't make a move without the Catholic Church's blessing. They have power, but very little. That's right. That's right. 
exactly. So we're just establishing these facts, okay? So now question five, how do the beasts of Revelation 13 and 17 compare? So now we're going to start moving a little more soon into the offspring of that, which it says uh, Revelation 13, 1. Who will read that for me? Revelation 13, 1. Revelation 13, 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Okay, and then another, why don't you go ahead, you're reading, just read 17, 3 as okay, well. Okay, 17, 3. want to compare these two. 17.3 it says so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy having seven heads and ten horns okay so the beasts of Revelation 13 and 17 specifically 13.1 and 17.3 they're the one and the same beast correct do you see that? Same descriptions. Now, here's the difference, though. Okay, the difference is in 1 through 10 and the beast of Revelation 17, they're obviously the same, as we said. Both symbolize the Roman power. Revelation 17 points out the church-state coalition with the church, the fallen woman, riding and controlling the state, which is the beast. And Revelation 13 also portrays two beasts involved enforcing others to worship. The first beast is the same power as the mother of harlots that was described in Revelation 17. Okay? So they're the same beast. Now, what is the meaning and origin of the word Babylon? We'll, we'll kind of just talk about this because I think we're all familiar enough with this. Where, where's the origin of the word of Babylon? Get a mic. Okay, that's the definition. Where's the origin of it? We're going to get the mic. Give it to Heather. I think Heather's got it. <laughs> um, from the Tower of Babel, yes. which means confusion. And what was going on there? What were they doing? Um, because of the flood, they decided to build a tower reaching to the heavens so that in case of another flood, they would be secure. Okay. Okay. Very good. And uh, go ahead. Give him the mic. And also by reaching, reaching the skies, they thought they, they would be able to finally give an explanation of why the, the flood had happened. Mm. Yeah. They, they wanted to find, to, find, to find the natural cause of, of the flood. Okay. And also, just to add to our definition and our understanding, we want to also realize that Babylon and Revelation, it also signifies a counterfeit religious kingdom that is also an enemy of God's spiritual Israel as well, of his spiritual Israel. So it's a religious, counterfeit religious group as well. Okay? So how does God describe Babylon and urging his people to leave? He wants us to come out, 18, 2 through 4. I'll read that. Say amen when you're there. Amen. All right, it says, And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon, the great is fallen, is fallen, has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. That looks pretty rich, don't it? Does anyone know what that is? I know it's a small picture. Joel Osteen. Joel Osteen. Yeah, that's his big church. and I mean, they're selling hot dogs and, and doing everything right in the middle of church service. Yeah, that's a real picture. Uh, that's the church service. They're walking around vending hot dogs like a baseball game. Well, that is a stadium. 
Don't you see, this is the stage, this is all the crowd. All that is the stadium, see it? And it goes up, but that's Olstein up there. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, I, I use that picture just to show the richness and the abundance. I'm not judging, just, just saying. <laughs> but, but yeah, that was just a good picture of what church has become today. Um, you know, if, if we're not careful, right? All right, so, so he told him to come out. Let me read this. So um, he told him to come out because Babylon has fallen. And I heard, uh, where are we at, Rick? Verse 4, thank you. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. Amen. So we don't want to receive of the plagues. Revelation 18 points to the time when as the result of rejecting the threefold warning of Revelation 14, 6 through 12, the church will have fully reached the condition foretold by the second angel, and the people of God still in Babylon will be called upon to separate from her communion. This message is the last that will ever be given to the world. Great Controversy, page 390. So this threefold message, this three angels message we read at the beginning, it's the everlasting gospel that's to go out to the whole world. This is the last warning message. And that's why it's important that we share it, that we teach it, that we preach it, because it is the last warning message. And what happened in Noah's day after the last warning message after 120 years? The door is shut. And uh, uh, we had Dwayne speak a week or two ago about uh, the closing of probation, right? The door will shut. The sins of Babylon will be laid open. The fearful results of enforcing the observances of the church by civil authority, the inroads of spiritualism, the stealthy but rapid progress of the papal power, all will be unmasked. By these solemn warnings, the people will be stirred. Thousands upon thousands will listen who have never heard words like these. That's why it's important we share it. Because remember, how many people were here for the uh, mission story this morning for Sabbath school? And remember that story? There was a divine appointment where he had 200 people just waiting to receive the Lord and their truck got stuck in uh, a creek of water and they had to go to the village, and when they went to the village, they found the chief who had 200 people wanting to learn more about God. So my point there is that there will be people, th oops, there will be thousands upon thousands who will listen, who have never heard the words like these before. Sometimes we're afraid to share our distinct truths and faith with people because we think, oh, they'll think we're weird. Oh, they'll think we're, uh, you know, a cult. Or they'll think we're fanatical. But don't worry about that. God has already prepped people who are waiting. And I don't know about you guys, but I always share this. That was actually what made me come to the church back in 1989 was because of this point right here. I, I heard it, but I had never heard words like these. I had never really heard these distinct truths. What do you mean the dead are asleep? What do you mean um, that the Sabbath is, is Saturday? What, these distinct truths actually rang a little bell in my head that said, I don't quite understand it all. Some of it doesn't make sense, but I can hear it's right. There's a ring that's telling me it's right. And there are people out there like that. So we have to remember, don't be afraid. I mean, if we only give them what they get at every other church they go to, there's no difference. There's no need for me to come to your church because you say the same thing my other church says. And I actually like my other church better, <laughs> you know what I mean, or whatever. But, but these distinct truths that we sometimes run from is going to be that bell that's going to ring loudly in their ear that's going to go, man, where have these words been? Where do you go to church? I want to go. Um, can I learn more? So remember that, guys. All right. Now, question number eight. 
it says, Jesus repeatedly indicts Babylon for making the world drunk with her wine. What is this wine? We covered some of it before. Number one, the Ten Commandments are not binding. How many people have heard that? That the Ten Commandments aren't binding. They died in the New Testament. Yes, they died in the New Testament. Okay. Uh, Sunday sacredness. What about the secret rapture? What about the secret rapture? Okay. There's, there's nothing secret about it. When the Lord comes, everybody will hear, every eye will see, right? The immortality of the soul. You know, that's one that for me, again, actually really was a comfort. And, you know, most teach that when you die, you go immediately to heaven, you know, or you go immediately to hell. But when I found out that when you die, you're just sleep, that was such a comfort to me. I didn't fear death as much. I still don't want to die right away, but I mean, I, I, I didn't fear death. And mostly for those that I love that have gone on to sleep, I'm comforted in knowing that there are two things. One, they're not burning in hell suffering. And two, they're not up there watching me still cut up and be a fool and, and, and kind of like, you know, be disappointed, you know. How disappointing would heaven be if they were up there right now looking down at most of this madness and this craziness, right? And you know, one thing, too, that always solidified that teaching for me, sometimes you should break things down very simple. Sometimes things get complicated and there's so much to learn and so many things, but sometimes you break things down or boil them down to the simplest thing, they make clearer sense. And I'll tell you, for those of you that may struggle with whether or not when you die you go right to heaven or hell or if you just sleep, I'll tell you what proved it to me was the second coming. And I said, well, if we're all in heaven or hell when Jesus comes, who is he resurrecting? What's the purpose of him to come resurrect the graves? There's nobody there. They're either in heaven or in hell. That's right. Like, it's, it's a That's right. Well, and it's just a tradition that we've been taught that over the years we believe, but we've never just questioned it or thought about it. And that's why I said, if you just think about it logically, that was the one thing that did it for me, was when I learned that, yes? Some people didn't really think about it logically. My mother literally has determined that my sister is coming to Jesus Yes, yes, that's the point. That's the point, exactly. Yes? Well, just in addressing what she was mentioning, oh, your mother is being visited. Oh, yeah. It's just <laughs> not for mercy. Exactly, so because the dead that know nothing. Is their reality, their perception is their reality. You know, it's just you have to let them know, okay, I accept the fact that, yes, you are getting visited, but it's not your daughter. And explain to them exactly that it falls under spiritism. Yeah. But what's really interesting, if I didn't know what I know, then I would consider that true. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And then we, then we look at confessing your sins to a priest. We talked about that. Counterfeit baptism. Someone in the back mentioned that. And a confusion of tongues. You know the tur the. Well, that's the churches who teach that, you know, you speak in tongues and it's a language that only God can understand, a heavenly language, and it's really gibberish. Uh, you know, the, the true tongues is what happened in the book of Acts, where basically God, if I was up here right now speaking like I'm doing, and you spoke German, you would be hearing me and hearing everything in German and understanding it clearly. If he was Portuguese, he'd be hearing Portuguese, but I'm speaking like normal what I'm speaking because I don't speak any of those languages okay that's true tongues and it's used to glorify God to edify the church to build up the church so that everyone might have understanding and then also you had to always have an interpreter there to make sure that what was happening was correct but we know that a lot of the teaching now I mean who knows what they're saying you know who knows what they're saying with the tongues and, 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 and you know, one other funny thing about that, uh, again, see, again, remember how I said just think about things logically? 
So when I would talk with people who believe that way, and they go, oh yeah, it's a heavenly language uh, that, that uh, only God can understand and Satan doesn't understand it. Well, last time I checked, Satan was pretty high up in heaven, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. I don't think there's a language that's spoken in heaven if there's other languages that are spoken that he doesn't understand or know, right? So again, it's just a lot of these things are very simple, but we cling and hold on to our tradition so much that, that we just don't even question, you know, anything else. Mm -hmm. So anyway, these are the points that Jesus indicted Babylon for. And again, remember we realized that the drinking and the wine and the drunken of, uh, drunk with the wine of her fornication, it's all the doctrines and the teachings. Because if you get drunk, then what are you? You're confused, you're you know, discombobulated, and that's pretty much what the you know, Christian world is out there without these truths, they're drunk with these false teachings, okay? Now nine, what power will support the beast in the end time? Go to Revelation 13, 11 through 12. Revelation 13, verses 11 through 12. Say amen when you have it. And another thing that I'm assuming, and I shouldn't have assumed, I should have made sure I made this clear too, when we're talking prophecy like we're talking, everything's symbolic. So when we're reading about these beasts, beasts in Revelation and in prophecy is a nation, a power, or a kingdom. So that's why we can also say, okay, well, what nation is it? What power is it? Because we know that a beast represents a nation, a power, or a kingdom. And I should have said that up front, and I kind of took for granted that everyone knows. Yes? That is, a, that is a good question for another study and lesson because you have to have some other foundation laid to make that make sense. But, but I will share that with you. I'll do a Bible study with you if you'd like to. Yeah, that would be awesome. That would be awesome. All right, so 13, 11 through 12. It says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon, and he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the, be the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And then skip down to verse 15. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be what? Killed. What happened in our story earlier with uh, John the Baptist, right? Two powers united, the mother-daughter team united, and persecution happened, and a prophet of God was what? Killed. The same thing here. When these two powers unite, okay, there's going to be laws and edicts and things put out that must be obeyed, and when they're not obeyed, then the next thing will be death. Now, um, to find out who this power is, let's talk a little bit. So this power rose up a little bit around the time that the Roman power rose up to its height. And what we find is that we have some little characteristics that I'll share with you that will show you that. But before I do that, let me ask you this. What nation or country or power can you think of that started out like a lamb and had two horns like a lamb? Okay. The United States, right? Remember we said that it left off to do good things, to come and to start off over new where you could worship freely and as your conscience dictated, right? And horns in Revelation and in prophecy represent power, right? And so there was two things that made this new thing powerful. It was civil freedom or civil religion, you know, civil freedom and religious freedom, okay? Civil and religious freedom. What country, power, or nation do you know in this whole world that's built off of civil and 
religious freedom. Amen. United States, you have a point. Yeah, I, lo I love how the book of Revelation is written, right? If we go and read immediately after the wounded head, the, the, the wound that was given to, to, the, to the beast, immediately after that uh, appear, appears this uh, new lamb-like uh, beast. And if we look in history, immediately after uh, the Pope was taken prisoner, France actually acknowledged United States as a, as a sovereign nation. Mm -hmm. So imme immediately after, and it's, it's amazing because uh, the, the book of Revelation was written as a block, was not written with chapters and, uh, and verses. And you see this cursivity in history. Yes. The papers you will get uh, death one, mm -hmm. and then immediately after, United States rose to power or started to rose to, uh, rose to power if we if we take history and the book of revelation he history will start to make sense for most of us yes and and the other point Lucien that's very important that you're making is for people who feel oh maybe the interpretation isn't correct and what you're saying is off as Lucian's saying you can go to the history books and follow world history and you'll see that it lines up just with what we're saying and with what we're teaching. And to tie in with Lucian's point, I was going to bring up these bullet points. Um, I think they're on here. Let me see. No, they're not. Yes. So the second beast of Revelation 13 symbolized the United States of America. Here's your evidence. A, the time it arose. B, it arose from the earth. Now, when you say it arose from the earth, again, I need to give you some terms for, for um, prophecy. Water is representative of people, nations, tongues, kindreds, or highly populated areas. So you'll notice our first beast came out of the water, okay, because it came from a highly populated area, which was Europe, okay, over in Rome. But the second beast came out of the earth, which is what? Dry, doesn't have the water, it's more sparsely populated and when the pilgrims and everybody that we talked about earlier came over to start America it wasn't as populated so it was a more you know earthy area so to speak so it also arose from the earth and then we discussed the two horns Lucy yeah also the war means uh, agitation war you know how how it happened in uh, in Europe as, as you mentioned uh, the, the pilgrims fled Europe because of conflict. Yes. There, there was a, a lot of conflict. Yes. We, don't, we don't know the meaning of the word conflict until we look in history and see what, what was happening before the forefathers left Europe and came to this, uh, to this land. Yes, that's right. Now let me give you a little more details on the evidences of these points. So the time it arose, God described this power as rising up about the time of the first beast goes into captivity and, as Lucian said, receives its deadly wound. The United States of America arose about the time that the Papsi's power was broken at the end of the 1260 years, which was in 1798. America declared its independence in 1776, voted the Constitution in 1787 adopted the Bill of Rights in 1791, and was clearly recognized as a world power, as Lucian pointed out, in 1798. And then we said that it arose from the earth. Uh, as we studied before, waters from which most of the kingdoms or beasts arose were a densely populated area. The earth represents the opposite. The United States fits this point perfectly because it was established on a sparsely populated uh, continent, like we discussed. And then lastly, talking again about the two horns. In prophecy, a lamb represents Jesus and a uh, horn represents power. The two great horns represent Protestant principles upon which America was founded. We said civil and religious liberty. The founding fathers fled from Europe to escape religious and political persecution. 
They established a society uh, based on the principles of civil and religious freedom. Government without a king is your civil freedom, and religion without a pope is your religious freedom. So again, your civil freedom, government without a king, and religious freedom is your religion without a pope. Now, we see people in office now trying to be a king, right? <laughs> you know, we're going away and going back to trying to have, you know, a government with a king, you know? And we, we tried to leave that. Yes, Aaron? Can we get a mic to Aaron, please? It's interesting how some people say we are a democracy. It's never been a government by the people. <laughs> it's, it's a republic. That's what Pledge of Allegiance, and they still do it in the school that I work in. Yeah. It says, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and, and to, to the, the republic, republic for which it stands. For which it stands. Yeah. That's right. And so the president, it's interesting, you said something earlier about the bishop would go to the king. Well, the, our president, who's Catholic, first Catholic that had not been, sat, uh, well, this, well, in this case, JFK was Catholic, but got assassinated because he didn't go along with the program. <laughs> Our president goes to the Pope, as well as Pelosi, the Speaker of the House, goes to the Pope to get advice, and then they come back here to implement. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And, and there we see that mother-daughter union that we're discussing today. Okay. Uh, let's see. Lucian, it's not clicking. Yes, okay. So now, the Protestants of the United States will be foremost. What does foremost mean? Leading, right? The foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. They will reach over the abyss to clasp hands with the Roman power, and under the influence of this threefold union, this country will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling the rights of what? Of our conscience. And Larry talks about that all the time. Larry talks about that all the time. Okay, trampling over the rights of our conscience. Those religious bodies who refuse to hear God's messages of warning will be under strong deception and will unite with the civil power to persecute the saints. The Protestant churches will unite with the papal power in persecuting the commandment-keeping people of God. This lamb-like power unites with the dragon in making war upon those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Wow. Amen? And, and, you know, it's interesting because, like I said, I, I really just think they're just using all these masks and mandates and vaccines as a precursor to, to change and to do what they're going to do because we know that uh, a nation speaks through what? It's legislation, right? Through its laws. And already we can see them speaking like a dragon. I mean, wear this mask, get this vaccine, and you lose your job. Um, I was listening to one of my programs the other day on radio, and I don't remember where it is, but this guy who, you know, he has split custody or whatever with the, uh, with the mother, and basically they're trying to enforce where if he doesn't get vaccinated, he can't have his visitation with his son. Hmm. We're, we're, yes, point, point right here. So imagine, my point is, imagine when they just change what they're implementing, when it's no longer that, but it's Sunday law. Well, unfortunately, this should not be new to us. When September 11 hit, that was one of the biggest hits to our personal freedoms, where they um, installed the TSA. Now it seems normal to go through that process to fly, when before you used to be walked straight to the gate to the airport, right where the planes were. And now we're only taking notice of this because now it's a direct effect to our livelihoods. Mm -hmm. It's taking away people's rights to go to work and earn money for their families, to see their loved ones, and now to travel. So now, like God said, he's ramping up his warnings to us. Right. And now it's as clear as day. If you can't see it by now, you're never gonna see it. Yeah, and you know, in piggybacking off her point, uh, very good point. 
and, and remember what I said, and we said earlier, things are progressive. It's progressive. So 9-11, like she said, that was like, and remember what I said, they, they build a format, and then they just plug and play and switch what they put in it. So in that same format that start, started with 9-11, like she said, okay, let's see what they're willing to give up to be safe when traveling and flying. Oh, look at all this they'll give up. Look how much they'll give up. Okay, cool, cool. Okay, switch it out. Now let's do health. Now let's make this virus. And now how much are they willing to give up to be healthy, to feel healthy, to be safe, to feel safe? And they're seeing that. And then when they take that out and they plug in the, you know, Sunday law, then it's just how much are they willing to give up to, you know, honor God, quote unquote, you know, and, and to act as if, you know, they're honoring God. So all it is, like I said, it's just a plug and play system. They have it set up where now all they have to do is just take out one thing and plug in something else, take out one thing and plug in something else, because they've already conditioned so much of the world to comply. Yes. prime set up for the Sunday law. What do you do? You release a virus that causes fear like no other in, in modern day times. And now people are saying like God is not in this because my loved one is dying. God is not in this because everybody is getting sick. So now what they're going to do, they're like, okay, we have to bring God back into the, to yeah. our homes and this is how we're going to do it. And this is how we'll so this is like a precursor thing. for the Sunday law. Exactly. Point taken. That's the point. Exactly. All right, the church appeals to the strong arm of civil power, and in this work, Papists and Protestants unite. Okay, so they definitely will unite. It says, in the last great conflict in the controversy with Satan, those who are loyal to God will see every earthly support cut off because they refuse to break his law in obedience to earthly powers. It's what's going on right now, right? I don't want to obey your earthly power telling me to do this, that, or another, to put something in my body that goes against my conscience, but guess what? My support's being taken away. Like you say, I can't have a job. I can't visit my child, you know, so on and so forth. Um, it goes on, they will be forbidden to buy or sell, Desire of Ages, page 121, 122. Satan says, and this is what we have to make sure that we don't fall under this, what Satan is expecting. Okay, we got to be stronger than this. Satan says, for fear of wanting of food and clothing, they will join with the world in transgressing God's law. The earth will be wholly under my dominion. Mm. Prophets and Kings, 183, 184. That's what he's hoping for. He's hoping that this will drive you to join forces and to give in. But we have to realize that no matter what, we can't give in. No matter what, you know. Um, hey, my mom asked me the other day, <laughs> she's like, okay, so you're telling me you're going to work tomorrow and you got to get a vaccine. You're going to lose your job? I said, I was looking for a job when I found that one. Yeah. What, 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 what's the problem? God gave me that job. He's going to give me another one. And guess what? If he don't give me one, then I'm going to have to really follow the advice and the counsel and be self-sufficient and create my own job, Hello. create my own business, Hello. you know, but... Right, but what I'm not going to do, and I'm not judging anyone else, but I'm not taking a jab. I'm not doing these things that you're, it goes against what I believe in, in my conscience and what I dictate, you know. But, but we got to be careful. You know, I'm laughing, I'm joking, but, but for real, this is real serious because this is, excuse me, this is uh, Satan himself is saying for fear of wanting of food and clothing, they will join in the world with transgressing God's law. Because the first thing they'll say is, well, God wants me to provide for my family. There's no way, there, there's no way he, he'll be upset with me because I chose to feed my family. No, he'll be upset with you because you didn't choose to trust him. You didn't choose to know that he would take care of you. Right? Amen. So according to the prophecy, what drastic change will take place in America? Can I have a reader for Revelation 13, 11? Revelation 13, 11. Nobody's raising their hands. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. All right. So we see that that lamb changed into what? A dragon, right? Like that picture I had up earlier with the lamb with the dragon under him. 
Okay, so again, we said that nations or powers speak by what? Their laws, their legislation, and do we not see it speaking as a dragon even today? Um, the United States, under the influence of Satan, will reverse its original Protestant principles of the separation of church and state. It will pass religious laws forcing people to worship contrary to conscience or else to be punished with economic sanctions and then finally with death. Now, for those of us who have uh, read Sunday Law, National Sunday Law, you know in the back, if you go through there, it's either I haven't read in a while, it's either the appendixes or one of the later chapters, my point is that what people don't realize is Sunday laws are already on the books. They don't have to make the law because it already exists. All they have to do is reinforce, start enforcing that law. So what would actually have to happen is people like us would have to fight to get it taken off of the books as a law, but it's already there. It was back in Virginia somewhere um, where um, for not attending church on Sunday, the first Sunday you were reprimanded, the second Sunday you lost some of your rations or food or whatever, and the third time you didn't come to church on Sunday, it was punishable by death. It was punishable by death. And this is like, I want to say, ah, I'm not going to quote the date because I don't know it. Read National Sunday Law, though. It's in there. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to misquote the date. But my point is, we have to realize that it's not going to be hard to do because the laws are already on the books. So just because the law is on the book, they don't have to enforce it. And that's what they're not doing right now. They just don't enforce it. But they don't have to come up with a lobby and a, and a group to say, hey, let's make this a law. Right. It's already a law. Right. So that's important to understand. Right. This is what, um, before we were all reborn, <laughs> um, you know you could never buy alcohol on Sunday. Those are the Sunday blue laws. Mm -hmm. That's what they are. Like he says, they don't have to make a law. It's already there. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of your southern states, it's still that way. Yes, you absolutely. You go to a lot of your southern states, mm -hmm. stores are closed oh, on Sunday. Yes. You can't buy liquor on Sunday. A lot of those laws still, yes, right here. A po a po hold on, hold on. Let's get your point on the mic. In some places, like in our country, El Salvador, some places like that, they already, Sundays, they're closed. They don't work. New Jersey has a, has a law enacted and enforced right now for uh, auto dealerships. They are not allowed by law to be open on Sundays, e even though their biggest uh, sales, day. sales day will be, will be on <laughs> Sunday. Yes, yes. So just keep that in so just keep that in mind, and, and sometimes when you're sharing this truth with people, you have to get them to realize it, because when we're sharing this, it sounds so far-fetched, mm -hmm. and especially in America, but like the sister said in the back, people should be able to see now a lot more clearly how it's not far-fetched. Yeah. But when you let them know that, wait, look, these laws are already on the books. They don't have to make up anything, and then like the sister said, Everybody who's ever traveled, and if you've gone through the South, you know that a lot of the Southern states are already that way. So again, it, it's just plug and play. It's just what do you replace it with? So America is changing, will change its tune, and we know that it will do that. Now, what three powers will unite against God's people in the end time? Uh, Aaron, will you read Revelation 16, 13, please? Revelation 16, 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the, of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Amen. So that's the threefold union. You have the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. The dragon is Satan working through pagan religions. And the beast is the papacy, as we've discussed. The false prophet in Revelation 16 is apostate Protestant America. So that's apostate, meaning what? What does apostate mean? They, they fell away from the original, right? Okay. Um, and then 
that's the same power as of Revelation 13, 11 through 17 that we were looking at earlier, the two-horned beast that was like a lamb, but that spake as a dragon. And this is the power, America, that will do great wonders and deceive them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of, be of, the, of the beast. So when we look at miracles, you know, yeah, yeah. Okay, let me, let me, uh, we, we, we discussed this. We discussed that they're going to unite. Now let's look at what effective methods this end time coalition will utilize. Uh, someone read uh, 1614. Now when I got to this point of my study and, and studying and doing some research, it got real deep. So I'm excited to share this. You hit a nail on the head, Rosalind. Revelation uh, yeah, verse 14. 14. For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto kings of the earth and of whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Okay. So they are what working miracles? Read that again, Corey. They are what working miracles? Spirits of devils. Spirits of devils. Working miracles. As God's last day people, we cannot rely on miracles to be our test or our proof for anything. Because in these last days, the majority of the uh, exciting things and, and the mesmerizing things that we will see, they will not be uh, of God. That's for sure. Okay, so we have to realize that. So Sister White says, the word of God declares that when it suits the enemy's purpose, he will through his agencies manifest so great a power under a pretense of what? Christianity. It'll seem Christian that if it were possible, they should deceive who? The very elect. Okay, it's going to seem very Christian, you know, what, what they're doing. All right. Um, let's go on. The saints must get a thorough understanding of what? Present. Present truth, which they will be obliged to maintain from the scriptures. That's what I love about Aaron. Aaron always wants you to get, give me a scripture. Where's the scripture for that? That, that sounds wonderful. Where, where's the scripture for that? I, was, uh, I, I get a group of texts that they're on, and uh, someone was sending something out. <laughs> and I was like, hey, that's great, man, but I need the text and I need the spirit of prophecy reference for those, please. Thank you and have a good day. You know, <laughs> you know? and I love that because it, it, it's the point that, that, yes, we have to be able to, as it says, maintain it from the scriptures. They must understand what? The state of the dead for the spirits of devils will yet appear to them. As you say it with your mother and daughter, will we'll appear to them professing to be what? Beloved friends and relatives who will declare to them that the Sabbath has been changed and also other unscriptural, uh, I think it should have said doctrines or teachings. It should have been something else. Is it on the next one? No, it's not. We didn't scroll it up? Okay. But we get the gist. That, that we can't rely on miracles because in these last days, deceiving spirits of demons are going to be working these miracles. Okay? Through the two great errors, the immortality of the soul and what? Sunday, Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions. While the former lays the foundation of spiritualism, the latter creates a bond of sympathy with who? Oh. With Rome. Yes, point, point in the back, point up here. Let's hit those two points. That one first. Corey first, Corey first, and then in the back. Okay, I just want to say that I'm, I wasn't um, a seven-day of Venice, and these learnings and teachings, sometimes it does get overwhelming, but when you, those, that information that you're putting up there, that's exactly what was taught to me from when I was younger, from down to my great-grandmother, my grandmother, my grandfather, 
And so it's, it's kind of difficult to transition from what, our, what I was taught right. to what now is known as the present truth. So it is, I really thank God for Brother Aaron to say, hey, I need a scripture. I need a scripture because I didn't go by the scripture. I went by the pastor, whatever he spoke, whatever he stated, wherever he said it, this, it came from Matthew, it came from Revelation, it came, wherever book it came from, I believe it because he said it and it's on the board. Right. So and I went home with that and I flew with it every day, every moment. So it's is um it's a blessing to know that God put it placed it upon my heart to convict me to to realize that I need for you to know the truth now. Yeah. Immediately. So the the fall in Babylon, that's that's my story, you know, come out of it. So I really thank God and you know, you guys I really do pray for you guys that you guys keep delivering the message, you know. Out of in love, in love. Because yeah. yeah, some some of the stuff it gets overwhelming. So I really thank I thank God for and me being obedient as well. So because that's it takes that as well. So yeah. I just wanna say that. Praise God. And then let's not forget the point in the back, let's see. Oh, back here first. I don't want her to lose her point. And we're winding up, guys, okay? We'll be too long. Um, it's interesting that these two are these two things are the great errors because I have a coworker. Um, he worships on Sunday and stuff like that. But we always talk about biblical things and the Christ coming back and stuff like that. But he full on believes in the rapture. And it's a point of, it can some, I have to walk away from the conversation because it can be a point of contention. And I, this person is my friend, as well as my coworker. And I still want to be able to speak to them about um, biblical things without offending them. Yes. And let God plant the seed. I mean, plant the seed and let God water it. Right. Um, but we were talking about Christ's second coming. And it was something, oh, and we're, he made a joke about the virus, and he was like, well, if I get the virus and I die, you know, I'll see you later, you know, and he said, and you'll still be here, and I was like, no, you'll be here too, you'll just be sleeping in the ground, yeah. and so he full-on believes that God is literally going to start plucking people, and I told him, I said, you know, if you read it in the Bible, it says that the, every eye is going to see him, I said, you can't have a rapture if no one's gonna see, I said, you know, I said Bible clearly, I said, but let's pray because these two people, when they are firmly dug into this, they are wholeheartedly dug into it. And it's one of the two hardest things to help somebody overcome and believe that the state of, what the state of the dead is and um, that seven day Sabbath is a Sabbath. Yeah, So, and, and you know something funny um, to tie into that, um, Again, remember, sometimes, I, I, like I said, I, I repeat it a lot, but always break things down as simple as you can. And when you break things down simple, you give simple, like, uh, not looking for allegories, but examples, um, it helps. So like, on that same topic about the state of the dead, one time I uh, was talking with a guy about it, and uh, like you said, it was just hard to overcome, and I was stumped, I was stumped, and then the God just gave me something and I said, uh, let me ask you a question. He goes, what? I go, okay. I said, you remember like before now, way back in the past, now we put all these beautiful inscriptions on the headstones of graves and stuff like that. I said, but in the old, old, old days, I said, what did they used to put on there? He said, RIP. I said, what does RIP mean? He said, rest in peace. I said, even way back then, they knew that they were just resting. I said, but it's changed. Yeah. And then I went into it and it kind of helped him open it up a little bit to make sense. He goes, wait, you're right. They did used to put that. I go, why did they used to put that there? Because back then, before the corruption came in, they understood that the dead were asleep and resting. They did used to understand that. Right, right. Um, Even for Sunday me, churches, they did used to understand that. Absolutely. For me, it helps when they're steadfast in what they're believing, like say with the rapture, you ask them to show you. You know what I mean? Like this, in love, be like, okay, you know, I, I'm, I'm feeling you on that. Show me. You know, because they have the burden of proof. Mm -hmm. You know, we already know we have, we have what we need. We have the truth. But it forces them to be like, okay, well, 
how do I prove what I believe? We can do it. But when you turn the tables, being like, okay, so what part of the Bible is that it? You know what I mean? And make them contextualize it. Give it to you in the proper context. Yes. You know, yes. give them that burden. Yes. And, and again, another quick, quick story about tying in on that Sunday sacredness. So uh, I came to the faith in uh, 1989, my senior year of high school. And uh, so I was studying and, uh, with these two young brothers. They were, they were teaching me. And um, so then I learned about the Sabbath. And I grew up Baptist. So at my house, every Sunday, the pastor would come by. He would go to different people's houses, but he liked coming to my mom's and our house a lot. So he'd be there. And uh, he was there. And I was upstairs studying. And it just happened to be a, a amazing facts uh, about the Sabbath. I was studying that one. And I heard him. And I heard him down there. I said, oh, pastor's down there. Cool. And I ran down there. And I took my little lesson. I took my little Bible. <laughs> I was like, man, I'm a little confused. He's like, oh, what's up, little brother? I said, yes, yeah. um, you know, I'm studying with this group, man, and, and they're telling me that Saturday is the Sabbath, it's the holy day, and you know, I'm Baptist, and I know Sunday is the holy day. I said, like you said, I said, but I'm trying to like find it to show them, and I can't. And I said, Pastor Boyd, I need you to show me, to show them, you know, that Sunday is the Sabbath, and it's the holy day. And the first person was ever totally honest. He didn't try to sugarcoat it or nothing. When I handed him that Bible, he closed it and gave it back to me. He said, I can't, little brother. It ain't in there. He said, it ain't in there. And from there, that's what convinced me of the Sabbath. And that's what made me be a seven-day Adventist after that point during my studies. So it's kind of like you said, you know, I flipped it on them. And, and when he had nothing, now you know how some of them, they'll go into, well, we keep it in honor of the resurrection, and they'll go through their whole litany of stuff. He didn't waste no time. He closed that Bible. He, gave, he said, little brother, I can't. He said, it's not in there. He said, it's not in there. He said, he said they're correct. All right? So, yeah. Persons will arise pretending to be Christ himself and claiming the title and worship which belong to the world's redeemer. They will perform wonderful miracles of healing and will profess to have revelations from heaven contradicting the testimony of the scriptures. And that's where we know they're wrong once they contradict the scriptures. But the people of God will not be what? Misled. The teachings of this false Christ are not in accordance with the scriptures. His blessing is pronounced upon the worshipers of the beast in his image. Notice that. People who were with the false Christ and are not like us who won't be misled, his blessings are actually pronounced upon the worshipers of the beast in his image, the very class upon whom the Bible declares that God's unmingled, unmingled wrath shall be poured out. So we don't want to, remember there's always two classes. We don't want to be in the wrong class that received the blessing of that false Christ. Okay? Continue on. Now wait, before I get to this one. Now this is the one that was deep. I was like, wow, snap. Well, I think, okay, you want to adjust it? Go ahead. You know how to, yeah, you know how to do that. That's your expertise. So while he's fixing that, especially what we're dealing with right now, and, and Roz, and I think I heard you kind of yell out earlier something about the healings and stuff like that. You know, we got all this COVID going on, and we got different stuff happening, and, and more things are to come. But one of the interesting things is these next few quotes in Spirit of Prophecy that I may have read years ago and kind of forgot. And when I read it this time, it was like, wow. And um, I don't want to give it away. I want to wait. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's it. No, 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 one more. No, no, one more down. Okay, and then the next one. It's the next one, but it's not that one. Is this one? No, no. Keep going down. Okay, this one. Okay, yeah, we got to move this up so y'all can see it. Okay. No, let me get rid of that title. Okay, is that good right there? Yeah, good. All right, let's go. I don't know. Let's just move on. Let's just, let's just finish up. I only got a couple more, yeah. Because we're already hitting anyway. Okay? Okay. All right, yeah, this is it. Okay. And then we go back to the Okay, ready? 
Okay. So this, this one right here, guys. The sick will be healed before us. Miracles will be performed in our sight. Are we prepared for the trial which awaits us when the lying wonders of Satan shall be fully exhibited? We have to realize that all healings aren't from God. Okay? Uh, and here's why. Men under the influence of evil spirits will work miracles. They will do what? They will make people sick by casting their spell upon them. I'm not saying COVID, but hey, they will make people sick, casting their spell upon them and will then remove the spell, leaving others to say that those who were sick have been miraculously healed. This Satan has done again and again. So what's being said there is he'll put the sickness on you, make you sick, and the same devil or demon that put it on you will take it off. So it wasn't the hospital, it wasn't the medicine, it wasn't God, had nothing to do with none of that. Satan is out there making many people sick and, and performing these miracles. Because again, what are we going to do? All we're going to do is just say, oh, it was a miracle, you know? We're not going to stop to see from whence that miracle came, okay? So that, that was just deep to me. I'm like, I never thought about that, that Satan would put a sickness on a person and then get them sick to death almost and then take it off, okay? Satan can, through his species, a species of deceptions, perform wonders that will appear to be genuine miracles. It was this he hoped to make a test question for the Israelites at the time of their deliverance from Egypt. Remember when he threw the snake down mm -hmm. and his snakes became snakes that ate Moses' yeah. snakes? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, this is referring to what you mentioned earlier. We tend to forget about Job. Remember, once God lifted his hand of protection, immediately Satan had access to Job and he he afflicted him, he afflicted his family. He took everything from him. Mm -hmm. And then he went back, and that's when he had the, the boils and all that stuff. So absolutely, we need to remember that Satan does have the power of affliction. He has power over illness and disease. Yes, yes, all right. So in closing, what will prevent God's end time people from being deceived? That's what we really want to know in all this. Isaiah 8.20, what? Let's read it together. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So we'll use the scriptures as our safeguard. And how to stand firm under persecution? We shall find that we must let loose of all hands except the hand of Jesus Christ. That's the hardest thing right there our family, our friends, our loved one, our spouse, our children, whoever it might be. You mean I might have to let their hand go? We shall find that we must let loose of all hands except the hand of Jesus Christ. Friends will prove treacherous and will betray us. They're already telling you to call on people. You know what I mean? So, you know, it's already happening. Friends, friends will prove treacherous and will betray us. Relatives deceived by the enemy will think that they do God's service in opposing us and putting us forth the utmost efforts to bring us into hard places, hoping we will deny our faith. But we may trust our hand in the hand of Christ amid darkness and peril. It'll be your own family member. Yeah, you know, they're over there keeping Sabbath. They're over there in that building over there. You know, I know they don't know no better. Just be nice when you grab them up, okay? I love them. Don't, don't, don't hurt them. Just go get them, you know, kind of thing, you know? All right? The only way in which men will be able to stand firm in the conflict is to be rooted and grounded in Christ. They must receive the truth as it is in Jesus. And it is only as the truth is presented thus that it can meet the wants of the soul. The preaching of Christ crucified, Christ our righteousness, is what satisfies the soul's hunger. When we secure the interests of the people in this great central truth, faith and hope and courage come to the heart. All right. And with that, let's pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the message today. Help us, Lord, to study to show ourselves approved. Help us to know that to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this, it's because there is no light in them. 
Lord, may we ever keep our hand clasped tightly in the hand of Jesus. Help us never to let it go. And Lord, fortify our minds with the truth. Give us a double portion of your Holy Spirit that we might be strong enough, Lord, to endure the trials that are coming before us. And most of all, Lord, let us not be selfish and to keep this to ourselves. Help us to share these truths and these messages with a dying world that needs Jesus. This is our prayer. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.